Hello guys, this is Joao and in this video I'm going to break down my top 5 phronesis riffs. I'll also go into a short analysis of said riffs and going to try to explain why they are so special and how they can improve your songwriting and guitar playing too. As you may or may not be aware, I've covered every song on this album so if you want to check out my covers you can... you can check the link here for the playlist. Before we get into these riffs, let me throw down some quick disclaimers. Disclaimer number one, I've learned these songs by ear. So certainly some of the fingerings, maybe even some of the notes, aren't that in the original Monument songs, but all the lessons still apply. Disclaimer number two, the top five phronesis riffs is an attention-grabbing title. What I really mean is my personal favorites, plus the ones I thought had some lesson to help you be a better songwriter or guitar player. Let's get into it. So to me, this really is the special moment in this song. But why so? The chords, the harmony is why so. Let's dive in. Okay, so for starters, the song is all in the key of B flat. But this part introduces a modulation to E flat. And already there, you've perked the ears of the listener for something special to occur. And we all know it's that sick breakdown at the end. But let's get into the chords. Firstly, let's understand this guitar tuning, because that's what allows these chords to exist. The tuning is from top to bottom E flat, B flat, F. But then there's a repeat of that, so E flat, B flat, F again. And then a low B flat, which gives you a power chord shape. So the way I believe these chords are built is the bottom three or four strings take care of your basic chord shape. So this is your E flat minor already handled, but then the extra notes on the top are all these beautiful open strings. So if I add them to this E flat minor, we have an extra root, ninth, fifth, and root. So we came from an E flat minor chord to an E flat minor 9 chord only by adding open strings. For the following chord again, bottom three notes D major, but then these get a lot tastier. I've written down the interval so I don't have to guess, so it's an extra flat 9 flat 10, a minor 3rd if you will, sharp 5, and a flat 9. So this ends up being D major, sharp, sharp 5, flat 9, and a minor 3rd. And by now you'd ask, is this a metal song or a jazz song? <laughs> but that's why these chords are so special. Disclaimer once again, I don't know if Brown only plays something like this, but I think I hear these notes. And the lesson remains, because monuments often use these open notes in their chords. So again, G flat major 9 is handled on these strings. You have a 9 now. And then you get an extra sharp 11, major 7, and a 6. So G flat major, whatever, 6, 7, 9, sharp 11. Let's speed this up, so... D flat major, another third, sixth, ninth. So D flat major six ninth. E flat major nine, root eleven, flat seven, E flat dominant plus ninth and eleven. And finally, oh this boy, so B major, sharp eleven, major seven, ninth. So B major seven nine plus a sharp eleven. Okay, these may sound stupidly difficult when you give them these names, but they're not. Again, you just let the low strings handle your basic triad, and then you let the top strings add whatever voicings they add. 
Or if you don't like the open strings, you can bar over some others. Instead of... Which also works. Now imagine if this part were just to be... It's pretty boring, right? I think we're better off with these extra notes. So the lesson I want you to take home from this riff is try adding some extra voicings to your chords. Instead of sticking to your usual power chord or a triad, try some new open notes or try some, uh, some bar chords on those extra strings to try get some new flavors into your chords. Next riff. If the last riff was special because of its harmony, then this riff is special because of its rhythm. But it's not the guitars that are to blame for this rhythm. Actually, there's two repeats of this riff, and the guitar always plays the same thing at the exact same tempo on both repeats, only the drums change. Let's dive in. Like I said, this riff is played twice, but the only thing that changes is the drums. The guitars always play the same riff at the same tempo. The only thing that changes in the drums is the way that they'll start accenting every 4 16th notes instead of every 3 16th notes. That way the song becomes literally 25% slower, but in reality the guitars are at the exact same tempo. This is the concept of metric modulation. And honestly if you've heard another, um, let's say gent song, you've already heard this before in various songs. Count along with me, let's try to understand this. You got it? That sick groove that makes you instantly bob your head in a different way. That's metric modulation. So welcome. You'll never want to come back. So the lesson to take home from this riff is try varying the drums on your riffs before you write new ones. Just a simple snare displacement or even full-on metric modulation like this example can give your riff an entirely new feeling. Next riff. I'm sure this riff made some of your top 5 lists too just because it's so groovy. But this groove is being prepared throughout the whole song. Don't believe me? Let's dive in. So in terms of harmony, there's not much to be said except maybe for the fact that it's in a Phrygian mode. So... missed a note there. And there's nothing really indicative of Phrygian anywhere else in the song, so there is something fresh about this riff when it hits. Also, if you've watched the studio updates, you know there's an overdub with an 8-string that does the lower octave, so it has some proper th thickness, boy. <laughs> this rhythm, though, something special is going on. I'll play the song's chorus for you. One, two, three, four. Did you get it yet? I'll play the chorus muted. One, two, three, four. I'll play just the right hand. Is any of this familiar? It's the same rhythm as the chorus. The 
That, in my opinion, is the main factor why this riff just feels so damn right when it hits, because the whole song has been preparing you for it. So the lesson to take home from this riff is try reutilizing the same rhythm in different riffs. What this does is it adds a consistency level to your songs, some coherency, makes the riffs gel together better, and makes writing a lot easier. Next riff. This is a strong contender, and it may not sound like it for hardest riff to play on this album. Actually, this, this whole song is a contender for hardest song on the album. But this riff is also a contender for most fun to play. Why is that? Let's dive in. This is as much of an Ollie Steel riff as I could think of, because it's all slidey and groovy and bouncing all over the damn place. But it's also very Ollie Steel in the way that it still maintains a high level of coherency. And it really makes sense. So let's break it down into four parts. What's happening here is that all the slides and pull-offs and whatnot have a solid base of four chords, or at least four root notes to land on. Those will be this C sharp, this B, this A, and then this B again. What you then get is something that's called horizontal harmony, wherein the notes in these chords aren't being played at the same time, but instead they're played horizontally, consequential to each other throughout the bar. So the first part goes. What chord is this? So. C sharp minor nine. Then again, remember we're aiming at this B. So he'll go something like. Sliding off this E into the B. And now. What chord was this? So B major 9. And again, I'm not quite sure on these fingerings, because this song was really difficult, but the lesson stands. With this A in mind again, remember we want to land here? He'll go something like this. Now is where the chord is drawn all over the fretboard, so... What chord, what chord was this? So... Whoa, something like that, so... A major, sharp 11. Cool. And again, we're trying to reach this B, he'll go. Sliding up. And now, so. Something like B major 6, 11, 2. And the turnaround goes something like. So all together, slowly, something like this. When all we started from was this. So the lesson to take home here is start with a basic idea of what chord progression you want to use, what chords are you traveling to and from, and then play the notes in those chords, not arpeggiated, but in different ways such as slides or pull-offs, and that way you can build a cool riff out of a basic chord progression. Next riff. So yeah, this riff had to be here. 
It's not the most complex riff. It's not the most, um, not even cool riff, I would say, but it is here. And you agree with me. Why is that? Let's dive in. Let's get something very important out of the way this pick scraping. It's actually done with a fork and knife. To be honest, if you haven't watched the Monument Studio updates and you're watching this video, do yourself a favor. So rhythm-wise, there's nothing too special going on except for the fast picking parts. Which, to be honest, are pretty cool because they're not very monuments-like, if you ask me. But the harmony is what I like most about this riff, so let's break it down. This is your basic C minor. You play that three times. And up here is where the cool stuff happens. So this is what's being played. It has only recently come to my attention that this chord has these few open strings. But I won't play them right now. Because what's cool here is the use of the sixths. And not the usual power chord. So these are the lowest notes on the riff. A flat, B flat, E flat, C. But they aren't the root notes of these chords because the note after is a sixth. So this chord, A flat F, is actually F minor, but in the first inversion, this B flat G, G minor in the first inversion. And again, E flat C, you guessed it, C minor. And here, C A flat. This sixth is minor, so it's a major chord. This is A flat major in the first inversion. Here's the chords played with their fifth, so you can better tell what's going on. And here's a version of the chords with no inversions, which sounds something like this. Pretty cool too, right? But this is very much a John Brown thing if you ask me, because you can see it in other songs such as Stygian Blue. All it does is introduce some freshness into the harmony by adding the inversions of chords, but in a somewhat tense way, because the intervals on the low notes Aren't your usual beautiful resonant perfect fifth? So the lesson to take home here is experiment with different chord shapes and inversions of your chords. So if you have a chord progression, try um, switching the bass up to the thirds or to the fifths so you get an inverted version of that progression. Or even better, try keeping the same bass line but turning the thirds up to fourths and the fifths up to sixths, and then you reharmonize your own progressions very easily. So let's review the songwriting lessons we've learned off of these five amazing riffs. One, add extra voicings to your basic major, minor, and power chords. Two, experiment with different drum feels over the same riff. Three, reuse the rhythm of a riff with different notes. Four, choose a chord progression and play it horizontally. Five. Try different inversions on your progressions for some different harmony. Thank you for listening to me rambling about how much I love this album. Phronesis is a total blessing, and each little riff deserved its little spot, but I can't be the one to do it, so I highly encourage you to check out Phronesis for yourself. Thank you so much for spending this time learning with me. I'll see you guys soon.